Uh, but before that, before I introduce our speaker, George Nash, I'd like to lead us all in a prayer. If we all bow our heads. Lord, thank you for bringing us here together today. Thank you that the young conservatives of Texas can ha come together to have this community and to honor you through our works and politics. Bless our thoughts, our conversation, that we may further serve and glorify you in political endeavors and in all things. We pray this in your name. Amen. So I'm very excited today to first talk to you about ISI, which is a sponsor uh, of today's event, of this weekend's event. So what is ISI? The Intercollegiate Studies Institute serves as the conservative bastion uh, for intellectual thought uh, across America. And so if you are a beleaguered intellectual conservative at your college campus, there is no professors or anything to tell you, uh, you know, which books to read, how to think about the uh, strain of Western political thought from uh, Jerusalem to Athens to Paris to London to Rome. ISI exists to be a resource for all of you to give you the right books, the right education, the right training to defend conservatism uh, from an intellectual philosophical standpoint, which is so needed today. And speaking of the history of intellectual conservatism, I'm so excited to, intru to introduce to all of you today our speaker, George H. Nash. Uh, George Nash is a historian, lecturer, and authority on the life of Herbert Hoover. A specialist in 20th century political and intellectual history, Nash is also the author of The Conservative Intellectual Movement in America Since 1945, The Crusade Years, 1933 to 1955, Freedom Betrayed, and Reappraising the Right. A graduate of Amherst College and a holder of a PhD in history from Harvard University, he received the Richard M. Weaver Prize for Scholarly Letters in 2008. So everyone, could you please give a round of applause to our speaker, George H. Nash. Thank you very much, James, for that gracious introduction, and good afternoon, everyone. It is both a pleasure and a, an honor to be in your company today as the guest of the Young Conservatives of Texas. I want to thank Manfred Wendt and his colleagues and board members for the invitation and for the courtesies that have been extended to me. And I also want to wa thank the Intercollegiate Studies Institute for having me appear today under its sponsorship. It is always a pleasure to work with ISI. Now, I come to you today from the state where I live, the state of Massachusetts, where it has been said that Democrats are Democrats, and so are the Republicans. <laughs> now, as a conservative Republican, I therefore especially enjoy this opportunity to be with you in Texas. Now, I've been asked to speak today about the intellectual history and current condition intellectually of modern American conservatism. I think it's fair to say that in 2022, American conservatives are in a state of acute anxiety, convinced that they are under siege as never before. Across the nation, the commanding heights of the federal bureaucracy, the news media, entertainment industry, the high-tech corporations, and the educational system from preschool to graduate school are dominated by people who seem increasingly hostile to conservative beliefs. In the social media and elsewhere, identity politics and the ideology of wokeism appear to reign supreme. Deepening the unease on the right is the recognition that the conservative movement itself is in disarray. Never, it seems, has there been as much dissension among conservative factions as there is now. How has the movement come to this point, and what might be the path forward? Perhaps the most important thing to assimilate about modern American conservatism is that it is not and has never been monolithic. It is a coalition, a coalition built on ideas with many points of origin and diverse tendencies, not always easy to reconcile. It is a coalition, moreover, that has evolved over three generations in response to perceived assaults from the left. 
The coalition began to take shape in the first decade after the end of the Second World War in 1945. Eventually, it grew to comprise five distinct intellectual groupings. First, libertarians and classical liberals like Friedrich Hayek, Milton Friedman, and Thomas Sowell, who extolled individual liberty, believed in free market capitalism, and opposed overweening bureaucratic government and the ever-expanding welfare state. Second, traditionalist conservatives like Russell Kirk, who were appalled by the development of rootless, secular, mass society in mid-20th century America, and by the weakening of the Judeo-Christian foundations of Western civilization at the hands they believed of secular relativistic liberalism. Third, ardent anti-communists like the ex-communist and iconic conservative later in his life, Whitaker Chambers, who focused on the titanic Cold War struggle against what Ronald Reagan called the evil empire of Soviet communism. Fourth, neoconservatives, that is, disillusioned former liberals and socialists who had been mugged by reality, as Irving Kristol put it, and who gravitated into the conservative camp in the 1970s and 1980s. And fifth, the so-called religious right, or as we say now, social conservatives, aghast at what they regarded as the moral wreckage unleashed upon American society by the courts and by the culture wars during the 1960s and beyond. Each of these components of the conservative revival had something in common, a profound antipathy to 20th century liberalism. As the conservative Cold War strategist James Burnham trenchantly put it, modern liberalism was essentially a means for reconciling the West to its own destruction. Liberalism, he said, was the ideology of Western suicide. The emerging conservative alliance of the Cold War years came to be led and personified by two extraordinary leaders, William F. Buckley Jr., founder of the National Review magazine in 1955, and a little later, Ronald Reagan. Both men performed an ecumenical function giving each branch of the coalition a seat at the table and a sense of having arrived. As conservative intellectuals began to network with one another in the late 50s and 1960s, a serious challenge arose to the fragile conservative identity, a growing and permanent tension between the libertarians and the traditionalists. It generated a tremendous polemical controversy on the right for a number of years, and it became known as the freedom versus virtue controversy for reasons that I'll explain in a moment. It fell to a former communist and editor at National Review, a man named Frank Meyer, to formulate a kind of middle way that became known as fusionism that is, an attempt to fuse or integrate or at least reconcile the competing and sometimes conflicting concerns of the libertarians and traditionalists. The libertarians with their exaltation of individual freedom and the traditionalists with their stress upon ordered freedom, resting primarily upon religion and the cultivation of virtue in the individual soul. In brief, Meyer argued that the purpose of government is to protect and promote individual liberty, but that the purpose of the free individual should be to pursue a life of virtue, unaided by and unfettered by the state. As a purely theoretical construct, Meyer's fusionism did not convince all his critics then or later. Not everyone approved of his celebration of individual freedom as the supreme good in politics. But as a formula for political action, 
and as an insight into the actual character of American conservatism, fusionism proved to be a considerable success. It taught libertarians and traditionalists that they needed each other and that American conservatism must not become doctrinaire. To be relevant and influential, it must stand neither for dogmatic anti-statism at one extreme, nor for moral authoritarianism at the other, but for a society in which people are simultaneously free to choose and desirous of choosing the path of virtue. When the polemical dust on the right finally settled, fusionism emerged as the de facto conservative consensus. In arriving at this modus vivendi, the architects of fusionism were aided immensely by the third element in the developing coalition, anti-communism, an ideology that everyone could share the presence in the world of a dangerous external enemy, the Soviet Union, the evil empire, the mortal foe of liberty and virtue, of freedom and faith, was a crucial cement for the nascent conservative movement. The life and death stakes of the Cold War helped to curb the temptation of right-wing ideologues to become schismatic and doctrinaire. The stunning end of the Cold War in the early 1990s had immense repercussions for all of us and also for American conservatism and conservative thought. Inevitably, the question arose, could a movement so identified with anti-communism survive the disappearance of the communist adversary in the Kremlin? Without a common external foe upon whom to concentrate their minds, would former allies on the right drift apart and try to go it alone? It was a temptation made infinitely easier by the advent of the internet and by the absence of a commanding ecumenical figure like Buckley and Reagan. It was not long before hitherto suppressed cleavages in the Grand Alliance began to surface. The most conspicuous example of this was the rise in the late 80s and early 1990s of an outspoken group of conservative traditionalists who took the label paleoconservatives in fierce opposition to the neoconservatives who had risen to prominence in conservative ranks in the Reagan years. To angry paleoconservatives, led by Patrick Buchanan, among others, the neoconservatives were imposters and interlopers who, despite their recent movement toward the right, remained at heart secular, crusading, Wilsonian interventionists abroad and believers in the welfare state at home. In other words, the paleoconservatives argued, not true conservatives at all. As the Cold War faded, paleoconservatism introduced a discordant note into the conservative conversation. Fiercely and defiantly nationalist rather than internationalist, skeptical of global democracy and post-Cold War entanglements overseas, fearful of the impact of third world immigration on America's historically Europe-centered culture, and openly critical of the doctrine of global free trade, Buchananite paleoconservatism increasingly resembled much of the American right before 1945, before, that is, the onset of the Cold War. Another sign of the times in the aftermath of the Cold War was a growing search by conservative intellectuals for new sources of unity for a new era. It became commonplace to advocate reformulations of conservatism with adjectives attached and to categorize conservatives in seemingly ever smaller groupings. Thus, the Clintonian 1990s saw the rise of leave us alone conservatism and then the 
compassionate conservatism of George W. Bush. More recently, appeals for constitutional conservatism, reform conservatism, and Tea Party conservatism have arisen in the land. This labeling impulse has generally been well-intentioned, no doubt, but it does suggest the sectarian tendencies at work. Still, the conservative intellectual movement and political community did not fall apart in the 1990s. Fusionist conservatism of the Buckley-Reagan variety continued to be the prevailing expression of conservative thought in America for some years after the Cold War ended. But no era lasts forever. This brings us to the extraordinary upheaval which Americans have been experiencing in the past decade or so. The eruption of insurgent populism on both the left and the right, and the political and intellectual fragmentation, fragmentation that it has caused. In its simplest terms, populism, which I define as the revolt of ordinary people against overbearing and self-serving elites, has long existed in American politics. You can find examples of it many times in American history. Traditionally, populism in America has come in two forms. A left-wing anti-corporate version, think William Jennings Bryan and Senator Huey Long, and more recently, a right-wing anti-statist version, think Ronald Reagan and the Tea Party movement. Both variants are vocally anti-elitist, but they target different elites. For the populist left, the enemy is big money. The private sector elite figuratively entrenched on Wall Street. Right-wing populism of the Reaganite Tea Party variety has focused its wrath on big government, the public sector elite ensconced in Washington. Both of these familiar forms of populism became prominent again after the Great Recession of 2008. Then in 2016, something truly remarkable happened. The fiery eruption of a new and even angrier form of populism containing both left-wing and right-wing elements, a hybrid that we have come to call Trumpism. Politically, Trumpism's antecedents may be found in the presidential campaigns of Ross Perot of Texas and Patrick Buchanan in 1992 and 1996. Ideologically, Trumpism bore a striking resemblance to the anti-interventionist, anti-globalist, immigration restrictionist, and America First viewpoint propounded by paleoconservatives like Buchanan during the 1990s and ever since. But instead of concentrating its fire solely on left-wing elites, as Reaganite conservative populism had done, the Trumpist brand of populism did something more. It simultaneously attacked, assailed, right-wing elites, including the Buckley-Reagan fusionist conservative movement that I described earlier. In particular, nationalist and protectionist Trumpism broke dramatically with the Reaganite internationalism of the Cold War era and with the pro-free trade supply-side economics ideology that you heard mentioned this morning, an ideology that Reagan embraced and that had dominated Republican Party, policy, party policy making since 1980. Trumpism thus posed not just a political challenge to the liberal establishment and a factional challenge to the Republican Party establishment, but also an ideological challenge to the separate and distinct conservative establishment long headquartered at Buckley's National Review. The distinctiveness of Trumpism in 2016 was that it assailed three establishments simultaneously. 
As a body of populist sentiments, Trumpism boldly objected to the fundamental tenets of nearly every component of previously mainstream conservative thought described in my remarks today. At the heart of Ronald Reagan's political philosophy and rhetoric was a single value, freedom, especially individual freedom. The right, in Reagan's words, of each individual to control his own destiny and work out his own happiness without subjection to what Reagan called the whims of the state. America is freedom, he declared in his farewell address. At the heart of Trumpian or Trumpist populism, however, is I think a rather different yearning for group security and solidarity, especially security for those who feel forgotten, disrespected, or left behind. If Reaganite conservatism, at least in theory, has been skeptical of the power of government to manage the economy and create prosperity, at the core of Trumpist populism has been a willingness to use governmental power to improve the lot of people whose plight has been overlooked by arrogant elites. Thus, in the past few years, the conservative community in America, a community built on ideas, has increasingly become a house divided over ideas, with factions engaged in an often rancorous tug of war. At such hubs of conservative discourse as the Claremont Review of Books, the American Conservative Magazine, and the website American Greatness, demands for a fundamental reconfiguration of the right are frequent, a right in which two of its former pillars, free market libertarians and neoconservatives, would be marginalized, if not entirely absent. The once dominant and implicitly ecumenical philosophy of fusionism has become denounced by a chorus of critics on the right as a dead consensus afflicted with what is called zombie Reaganism and with what they bluntly deride, deride as free market fundamentalism. Meanwhile, the institutional custodians of fusionism, particularly those inside the Beltway, have been re ridiculed by some on the right as conservatism inc, conservatism incorporated, as if the conservative establishment were just another business trying to make money. Fusionism, say some of the critics, was perhaps a necessary contrivance during the Cold War, but it's irrelevant now. And so a determined quest for a reformulation of conservatism has begun for what one might call, at least in some circles, Trumpism without Trump. Not so long ago, leading conservative thinkers of the Reagan era and its afterglow routinely associated their philosophy with the principles of limited government, low taxation, free trade, and freedom of enterprise. In 2022, however, growing numbers of populistically inclined insurgents on the right are criticizing these principles and ideas as outdated and even unconservative dogmas. Okay. Ditching the anti-statist rhetoric of Reaganite populism, they are calling instead for the unabashed and, energ and, and energetic wielding of government power in pursuit of their economic and cultural agendas. In their deep hostility to globalism, and transnational progressive elites, and their dismay about cultural disintegration at home. Some of them are now looking to old world nationalists and social conservatives for inspiration and intellectual support. Can you hear me all right? Is there a, an echo effect a little too much? No, it's okay? Is it okay, clear? Okay, thank you. Indeed, one of the most striking intellectual currents in America in the past decade has been the growing Europeanization, or more precisely, continental Europeanization of American conservatism. Interest in Europe, of course, is nothing new to the American intellectual right. One thinks at once 
of Russell Kirk's classic volume, The Conservative Mind, and his extolling of the British statesman Edmund Burke as the father of Anglo-American conservatism. Until recently, the American right has tended to identify most with what Kirk in one of his last books called America's British Culture, and with such British luminaries as Burke, Adam Smith, and in recent times, Margaret Thatcher. While often critical of classical liberalism purism, the, the American right has tended over the years to align itself with the liberty-oriented conservatism of the Anglosphere instead of the more status brands commonly found on the right on the European continent. It is all the more striking then, and I'm looking at this from the perspective of a historian, it is all the more striking then that in the past half dozen years since the Trumpist explosion, a number of conservative intellectuals and celebrity figures in the United States have sought out right-wing political leaders and anti-liberal thinkers on the continent, like Prime Minister Viktor Orban of Hungary, for guidance in fashioning an alternative political path. This search for non-American models is a measure not only of the seeker's intellectual curiosity, but also of their estrangement from what some of them deem to be a feckless and feeble American right and a decadent American regime riddled, it is claimed, with Lockean liberal error and its allegedly soul corrupting consequences. Intellectuals, as this audience probably knows, are not the only ones on the right who are now thinking outside the box of Reaganite fusionism. In the political arena, right of center members of Congress, like Senators Marco Rubio and Josh Hawley, are openly lambasting big business, especially big tech, and are advocating forms of governmental regulation to rein in big business in the name of what they call the common good. And these are themes that you would not have heard very much on the American right just 10 years ago. This mounting intellectual tumult on the right is motivated by more than economic concerns, however. At the heart of national conservatism, integralism, post-liberalism, and the emerging self-styled new right is the conviction that America is embroiled in nothing less than a cold civil war over the future of our republic. An irrepressible conflict pitting conservatives against an enemy determined they believe to destroy their way of life. The rapid rise of left-wing identity politics and progressive wokeism, the spread of social media censorship and the cancel culture, the tolerance of massive illegal immigration along the southern border, the toppling of historic monuments and the wide dissemination of left-wing critiques of American history in school curricula. These, to many conservatives, are manifestations of an all-out cultural revolution being waged against them by an increasingly authoritarian foe. In parts of the American right and parts of the American left as well, the rhetoric of conventional politics is giving way to the apocalyptic rhetoric of war. So, where does American conservatism as an intellectual force go from here? Can liberty-loving Reaganite fusionism and Fourth of July patriotism be reconciled with the martial rhetoric and heterodox policy proposals now emanating from post-liberal sectors of the right? Can Americans who consider classical liberalism to be an integral part, not the whole, but an integral part of America's political fabric, find common ground with those who claim that America was indeed liberal from the outset and that this is its fatal flaw? As a historian, I cannot predict precisely how the current intellectual drama on the right will unfold in the years just ahead. 
but I think I can predict that there will be no total restoration of the fusionist status quo that existed before 2016. History does not work that way. What is more likely to happen will be an attempt by mainstream conservative figures to refurbish the house of conservatism with a certain amount of Trumpian furniture, but without Trump himself as the proprietor of the house. Many conservatives in the political arena will probably become somewhat less libertarian on economic and social policy and more anti-elitist in their posture as they try to nail down the working class vote at home and confront the military and economic front, uh, threat from China. Whether Trump comes again to the political stage or goes away, Trumpian populism with its counter-revolutionary overtones is likely to remain part of the right-wing landscape for a while, for it is being fueled by an apprehension which millions of grassroots conservatives now share, that treat traditional America as a free, well-ordered, and basically decent society is in peril, and that a soft despotism of the illiberal left is arising in its place. But it is also likely that under relentless pressure from the cultural left and the Biden administration at home, and from emboldened and aggressive authoritarian regimes abroad, many conservatives will again find inspiring the philosophy and rhetoric of individual freedom, embedded so deeply in the American political tradition and so brilliantly articulated by Ronald Reagan. And not, and not just economic freedom and entrepreneurial freedom, but religious freedom, freedom of speech, and the freedom to live and let live without harassment. It is also conceivable that under the impetus of the ghastly war in Ukraine, a more assertively interventionist or internationalist and freedom-centered foreign policy, and perhaps interventionist too, will once again appeal to most American conservatives. We shall see. Faced with these multiple challenges, can conservatives regain their moorings in 2022? From my perspective as a historian, I see several reasons for hope. First, conservatives should take heart from one of their most impressive achievements of the past 50 years, the creation of a vibrant counterculture of alternative media, foundations, law firms, think tanks, homeschooling networks, classical Christian academies, and more. This flowering of applied conservatism, this building of conservative institutions, is a remarkable development. The Young Conservatives of Texas is a notable example of it as are the many organizations who have been supplying materials in, that are on display out in the hall. And I think you would say it's also represented in the three superb panels that we heard this morning. Since the 1960s, in other words, what has come to be called a conservative parallel universe has arisen in America and it continues to expand. Conservatives should also take consolation, if not exactly comfort, from the acts of aggression being committed by fanatics on the left. These excesses are opening up new opportunities for conservatives to cultivate alliances with dissident liberals and others in specific areas in defense of free speech, civility, and a balanced interpretation of American history. One momentous phenomenon in this front is the growing revolt by countless parents outraged by the indoctrination of their children on racial and sexual matters by left-leaning ideologues in the nation's public schools. It has the potential to shake up old political alignments. Nevertheless, conservatives, I think, need to do more than celebrate past achievements and react defensively to provocation from the left. They must redouble their efforts 
as Buckley and Reagan did, to expand their influence beyond the ranks of those already committed to their cause. Too often it seems that the conservative parallel universe does not interact sufficiently with those who live outside its boundaries. And that population includes millions of Americans, Asian, Hispanic, and black Americans, who in the past two years have been repelled by the zealotry and illiberalism of the woke left. More than at any other moment in recent times, these Americans are open to conservative persuasion. In pursuit of these and other opportunities, conservatives should not forsake their traditional language of liberty. Reckless and militarized rhetoric can repel as well as attract. And successful politics, as Reagan taught, is about addition, not subtraction. The new governor of Virginia, Glenn Youngkin, has provided an instructive lesson in how this can be done. At this perilous juncture, it might be useful for conservatives of all persuasions, and I know you represent many persuasions in this room, to step back from entrepreneurial polemics for a moment and ask themselves the simple question, what do conservatives want? To put it in elementary terms, I believe they want what nearly all conservatives since 1945 have wanted. They want to be free. They want to live meaningful and virtuous lives. And they want to be secure from threats both beyond and within our borders. They want to live in a society whose government respects and encourages these aspirations. Freedom, virtue, safety, goals reflected in the libertarian, traditionalist, and national security dimensions of the conservative movement as it has developed intellectually over the past 75 years. In other words, there is at least a little fusionism in nearly all of us. Conservatives should remember that. Finally, if conservatives are to reclaim our culture and prosper again in the public square, that she, they should retain what I would call a fusionist sensibility. That is to say, an ecumenical disposition, recognizing that the wisdom of conservatism comes from many sources. They should resist the sectarian temptation, the impulse to go it alone. In conclusion, let me tell you a story. A number of years ago, I am told, a young member of the British Conservative Party was campaigning for a seat in Parliament. At a public rally, he zestfully defended the Tory platform and then concluded, these are our principles. If you do not like them, we have others. <laughs> Today, I have offered you a smorgasbord of conservative principles or more precisely, an intellectual framework for understanding the recent history and current condition of the American right. On its face, the conservative movement may appear to be an unstable alliance, especially in 2022, when the populistic and even pugilistic pressures run deep. But for many years now, it has also proven remarkably resilient united in the last analysis by a recurrent sense of challenge from the left. Whatever the future may hold, conservatives should always remember that to be successful in the public square, we need minds as well as voices. Fortunately for us, and thanks to the labors years ago of luminaries like Kirk and Hayek and Buckley and others, the resources for political and cultural renewal are now easy to find. With the wisdom of conservatism to draw upon, you, the young conservatives of Texas, have the opportunity to help lead our fellow Americans to better days. Thank you. <laughs>
Hi, thanks for, thanks for the talk. I really appreciate it. Yes. Um, my question is this, you know, with Frank Meyer and the, the fusionism, it wasn't just a political coalition as you, you may know, there was an ideology behind it that in fact, the, the virtue was compatible with freedom. And in fact, freedom was necessary for virtue. So these two ideologies fit together. What is the overriding sort of philosophical theme that could tie modern populism with say, the other members of the traditional co conservative coalition? Is there one? Or are they inherently at odds with, enough, with one another? Well, I, I would go back to what I said at the end. What do conservatives want? And it seems to me that in our hearts, we want many things that have to be balanced. We want to be free, we want to be virtuous, we want to be secure, we want f entrepreneurial freedom, freedom to travel, et cetera. And you need to often balance those depending upon the particular circumstances and the primary threat to them uh, at that point in time. Uh, I would also point out a quote with something that Russell Kirk liked to say, that conservatism is not an ideology. It's a nice, nice little package with its, its 14 points or its 10 commandments or something like that, you see. It is really a negation of ideological thinking. Uh, that is a negation or an opposition to the thinking of the progressives who really want to change everything and create a utopia and, and, and utter abstractions that don't work out in practice in the real lives of everyday people. So I, I would enter those cautionary remarks into it. So I don't think you have to say we're all for freedom but not for virtue, or all for virtue but not for me. I think that there were tendencies initially to, to kind of emphasize one extreme or the other, and what Buckley and Meyer in particular, as the theoretician of all this, tried to do was to say that, that it fits. You have to have free freedom in order to be virtuous, but if you use your freedom to be libertine, then that is not a conservative outcome. Now, conservatives argue about, to, and they have ever since, because there are critics of, of, um, of Meyer, and I, I will just quote one, one line, a kind of uh, proto-integralist, to th use the, the jargon of the day, uh, named Brent Bozell, Buckley's brother-in-law, who was a big sparring partner with Meyer over this issue of freedom versus virtue. Where do we put the, pr the, the pressure point, or where do we put the balance for conservatives? And Bozell said in opposition to Meyer, who he thought was too libertarian, he said, the story of how the free society has come to take priority over the good society is the story of the decline of the West. So you have, and Bozell literally went off to live in Spain under Franco's regime, which we would call authoritarian, or maybe modified over time, but it was still an authoritarian regime. So that was considered to be way outside the bounds of, of American res respectability of American possibility even. So I, I guess uh, what I'm, I'm concluding then uh, from your question is that there is what it, the populists don't come in and say we have a whole new you know, fr framework of, um, of thought and, and, and just I, ho I hope that doesn't go, it doesn't go that way. We need to build on what Kirk liked to call the wisdom of our ancestors, people who have gone before us, people who have had f tremendous insight. And so what we might need, though, is to put some of those permanent insights into language that appeals to you, your generation, or to the middle-aged and older middle-aged among us. So, as Whitaker Chambers said, each generation finds its own language for an eternal meaning. So I don't want to stand here and say, I think we need a whole new scheme of meaning. We have basic truths to expound, but it might be necessary to find better language, more welcoming approaches that can reach out and convert and not you know, uh, turn off uh, people who might initially disagree. So I hope that's somewhat helpful. I don't see a new fusionism emerging. What, however, might emerge from, from the use of these elements in, in different vocabulary and so forth is, I hope, that, uh, what I call a fusionist sensibility, that we each in our own subdivision of conservatism does uh, not have all the answers. And so we, we need, therefore, a certain kind of humility and recognizing that while we may differ and differ sharply, perhaps, as has often been the case in conservative history on one issue of the day or another, nevertheless, uh, there is much that we should think of in the larger picture that unites us. So I have found it helpful, at least in my own life, to just ask that question, what do conservatives want? And so you get down from all those thunderclouds of polemics and sometimes name calling and so on that, that we see uh, in, the, in the blogosphere and on cable TV. And so you get, down, you get down to sort of common sense 
level of discussion, as Governor Youngkin did so successfully in his election campaign, then you have a way, I think, of finding more comradeship among the ranks, even though there will always be points of difference. So that would be my answer. My question is about the emergence of a conservative a parallel universe that you described, if we are successful in building that, for example, are we going to have liberal companies and conservative companies for every product on the market? And if so, how can we remain a united country in that world? So are you saying that there are now going to be conservative companies and as well, if you want conservative products or? That? Yeah, like yeah. for example, razors. Now we have like liberal razor companies and conservative razor companies, yeah. pillows, et cetera. So how do we um, still keep a united country? Yeah, that's a, that's, a, that's a very good question. It's a very fundamental question. And I think about that from time to time because it does seem that we are increasingly polarized and, uh, and so self-segregated in our respective camps, and then there's, there's obviously a kind of a, a tug of war going on within the right, which is not united at this point. Uh, so again, one has to look to, obviously, the, just the importance of civility in presentation. Uh, hopefully, we can work toward a, a society in which the people, people can be left alone more. One of the problems, I think, with big government is not simply the economic stagnation and the overregulation that can occur from big government, but that it tends to be like a giant sponge. It sucks up all the energy in, in, in the room. And so the more government there is in your life, I think the more, more possibilities there are for friction. So what conservatives should be striving ultimately to do is not to simply create a parallel country a, a parallel universe or you know, parallel country, but r trying to find ways to keep more of our daily lives outside of the realm of government control and politics. So the politicization of society or the over-politicization of it maybe is something that is a long-term trend that uh, I think conservatives should unite, unite on in opposing. Maybe for different reasons. Libertarians might say, say, on the grounds of individual freedom, I don't want government bossing me around. Traditionalists might say, well, we want civil society and churches and other local institutions to have more autonomy and not, ha not be, have all the energy abs absorbed out of that local network of communities, the Tocqueville in America, if you will, and sort of turn, us, uh, turn ourselves into a highly centralized empire, you see. So you can, you can come to the same kind of point, but using different vocabulary. And so if we sort of study one another's vocabulary, I think that can help. So I do think you're right that the, 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 the headwinds are strong here. And I live in Massachusetts, so I <laughs> experience them. So it's such a breath of fresh air to come here to, uh, to Texas today and be in this kind of company with this kind of conversation, because in many places I couldn't have one with people up there, and that's, that's too bad. Now, I do think even in Massachusetts, so there are a lot of people who are just keeping their heads low because they know that the commanding heights of the media and government bureaucracy and so on are so intrusive and, and, and so authoritarian even that it's better just to shut up and, and try to live your life. But that, is, that may be tactically wise in individual cases, may be necessary, but it's not what Solzhenitsyn called for, somebody quoted him this morning, uh, do not live by lies. So at some point we have to, to confront it. But I, I don't have, again, a, a nice, neat, wrapped up policy package for you, but I hope that what I'm, the perspective I'm trying to bring to this will be helpful as you think about it, that we need ways to shrink the political sphere, and that makes it easier, I think, for people to live together harmoniously. I just wanted to discuss uh, foreign policy, specifically the difference in foreign policy from the Cold War big international quasi-interventionist coalition as compared to the more modern nationalists from the paleo-conservative and populist movement. Do you think that these two different views of foreign policy can be uh, reconciled into one coalition? And do you think that one view will become more dominant or do you think they'll find some way to meet in the middle? 
Well, uh, I emphasized what I think is, is historically correct to say that the Cold War bipolarity of the world was, uh, was something that was on the consciousness of conservatives of all persuasions. So they couldn't go off and into some fever swamp somewhere with some conservative utopian vision. There were some libertarians around who felt that we shouldn't have a defense department, you should privatize defense, you know, that kind of thing. You, you sort of get that when you're in college at a certain point, you hear the certain, uh, certain uh, s solutions proposed. And I, I, when I was in college, I met monarchists and anarchists and so, and so it's kind of, you know, a part of you know, learning the ropes and all, but that's not the real world. Now the real world until 1990 or so was the Soviet Union and its allies versus the West. Now when that disintegrated, a lot of people started saying, well, do we need NATO anymore? Because NATO was meant to, to resist the communist advance across Europe in the Cold War period. So a lot of questions were raised. And uh, then comes, came the two great uh, events of the Iraq War and Afghan War and, and so on and a considerable disillusion with the ability of American power to project itself productively into cultures that were very alien to our own. Now we're in a moment, and I don't know whether it'll last or just what, but it's a moment in which conservatives are offering different views, and that's probably gonna come up in the next panel, so I won't go on too long about this, but uh, there are more conservatives say, well, something needs to be done to help Ukraine, but without crossing the line that gets us involved in a ground war with Russia or worse, a, you know, a, a, a nuclear war or something like that. So, but I, I sense that from the initial commentary that I read about on the right, that there is a, now a more of a minority of some of the nationalist populist types who are saying, let's be prudent here, let's, let's aim for a negotiated settlement, let's, let's not get carried away with our rhetoric of, of, um, of freedom. And then I would gather probably the majority of, of, of the conservative, what remains of, of it, of the conservative establishment and Republicans in Congress are, and the, and the American people by the polls again at this point, are, are saying that we, we need to do something that is uh, to um, somehow repel or enable the Ukrainians to repel this monstrous uh, um, invasion. So I think that there's a, that, I said it was conceivable, I, I can't predict for sure, but it's conceivable that that Reaganite attitude that, that while we now have enemies abroad, we may not call them communists, uh, communists, but they're communists in Beijing and that they are in alliance with Putin and Russia. Putin's not a communist, but he's perhaps a Russian imperialist of some kind. Anyway, uh, so there are external challenges that have to be met and this has led to a kind of an uptick in the, the um, Free, freedom loving rhetoric because you look at what's happening to the Ukrainians and their magnificent bravery and so on. You see the, the indiscriminate bombing of housing complexes and all that sort of thing. You can't defend what the, the, as someone said, whatever you think of Putin's motivations, you can't defend the way the Russians are waging the war. And so there's, I think, a, a kind of a, an emotional tug to defend Ukraine as the victim of this whatever you think of the whole history of what came to this point. So that's going to be around, I think, but there is that cautionary element, which I think right now, and I'm trying to say this as an observer, I'm not trying to sort it all out for, for uh, in, a, in a definitive way. I think that there is this a, a minority sentiment on the right that is taking not a pro-Putin point of view, but is saying, let's be cautious here, let's not make mistakes that they would argue had been made previously by American overreach. But right now, I think the predominant view on the right is that it's the Russians who are making the overreach and that it is incumbent upon America prudently to try to restrain that. And also they're thinking more of, of, of China coming up. So that would be my answer. Thank you for giving the speech. It was really awesome, I must say. Um, I have a question more on um, kind of the founding of America and the conservative movement. When you brought up the part about freedom versus virtue, it made me um, think of the um, conflict between the Federalists and Anti-Federalists, um, especially between like James Madison or writers like Brutus and how the anti-federalists, you know, would tend to, you know, extol virtue of the people while the federalists would more try to go for the liberty angle. 
So would it be safe to draw a parallel here on these ideas? A parallel between them and? Um, the, your comparison between, um, and between uh, libertarians and um, yeah. uh, traditionalists? Well, I answer it this way. Um, if you think of the American Revolution, it was initially uh, an attempt, hopefully, to maintain autonomy at the, before the fighting release broke, uh, maintain autonomy and freedom within the British Empire. Then it became a rebellion against what was said was an overreaching British Empire. So you get the Articles of Confederation coming along with the states basically kind of, it's a, kind of a league of equal states. And so they fight the revolution and then you have the 1780s and lots of things happen in the states that cause inflation, the veterans are not paid, etc. And so there emerges a feeling that George Washington came to exemplify by being president and president of the Constitutional Convention that said we needed to have more centralized power so that the, this league of states can have a single foreign policy. And it has to have some way to maintain the overarch uh, something beyond the quasi-libertarian or decentralist um, articles of confederation. So you get the centralizing term. And then James Madison, as the price really of getting the Constitution ratified, promises what we know is a Bill of Rights. So you read the Bill of Rights and it becomes an enumerated listing of restraints upon the newly central government. So we swing back a little bit. And then we have a whole period up to the Civil War uh, where there's an argument as to whether America is a kind of a nationalizing nation or is it more of like the Articles of Confederation with, with states' rights. So I, as I look at American history, uh, it, it swings back and forth between centralizing impulses and decentralizing impulses. And sometimes they have to conflict because most conservatives say you need a, an army, you need a defense establishment. Well, that's costly and it involves taxation. And we can argue prudently about how much should be spent on what, whether we should have a volunteer army or a draft and all those sorts of you know, sort of policy issues, but most people say we need to have sufficient strength in the national government that it can defend the country. At the same time, we don't want the national government to become a tyranny in, in itself, a kind of a bureaucratic super state. So I think part of the American story, and you, 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 you're, you touched on one, one uh, episode in that, is this sort of swing, which we, I guess, both have in our hearts. We want to have, have sufficient national power so that the nation survives, but we don't want the national authority to become so overweening that our freedoms and our decentralized communities are overrun. So I don't think it's all or nothing. Uh, you can call it, you, and some of that libertarian traditionalist controversy was part of a larger conservative discussion in the 50s and 60s as to what is the conservative tradition in America, and there isn't time to go into, into that, but it's, it's, there is a certain analogy that you can draw, but I'm trying to put it in the, this larger sense of the, the, these, this pendulum swing in American history between centralizing and decentralizing tendencies. So, uh, hope if that you have something. No. Okay, all right, thank you. Yes, uh, Mr. Nash, thank you so much for your great lecture. Uh, I know you studied Herbert Hoover, and of course Hoover was president during the Great Depression, and since then we've had a great recession about 14, 15 years ago. It looks like with all the monetary expansion, we might be on the verge of another great recession. Uh, are we strong enough as a people to handle another great recession? I just see so much anger out in the country on, on both right and the left, and even people who are anti-ideological, which I think is the majority of the American people. Uh, so if we do have another recession on the horizon, uh, as a people, are we strong enough to survive that? Or will we be going down the same road as Weimar Germany 100 years ago? Yes. Well, again, I, I can, I can pr uh, not predict, but as a citizen, I hope that we're not. And I agree with you that if we were to have a, a severe uh, stagflation cycle in this atmosphere, where we already have so much polarization on other matters, that it would really strain, strain the country. And uh, that would be um, uh, not, not a pleasant time. I don't know what that, how that would manifest itself. It may manifest itself in the short run, with a Republican sweep, potentially, in 
later this year. And it might even manifest itself with a Republican recapture of the presidency in 2024. But uh, I, ca I can't say much more than that, except to, I guess, to say that we ought to hope and pray that by our own comportment as conservatives, we can keep the, 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 the uh, rhetoric from turning into irrevocably into a kind of rhetoric of civil war. And I'm not one who thinks that we're on the verge of, you know, armies along the Potomac or anything like that. Our economy is too mixed up, there's too much travel, you're just not gonna have that kind of a division. But we could, and I, I do worry about this, we could have uh, scattered political violence. Uh, not, not organized in the sense of, of leading to a, a civil war in the classic sense, but friction that would, would only uh, heighten our national sense of fear and animosity and so forth. So uh, I, I hope that our political leaders, and you are about to become some of them, will keep in mind that uh, in politics, in the context, conduct of statecraft, it's, it's necessary to to maintain what, again, Russell Kirk liked to call prudence, uh, that uh, not to surrender your principles, but to expound them in ways that can hopefully build bridges rather than burn them. So we have that, that concern that if things get economically worse, it's going to, at least going to increase the, the rhetor rhetorical uh, storm around us. And I, I hope and pray that it doesn't get more violent than that, potentially. So that is a concern, but um, I, as I said, there are grounds as well to hope. And so I'd like to add, uh, end with a note of hope. So go forward, onward. Thank you all. into our next